as a gardener, do you find winter a little bit long and boring and, you know, January hits and you start thinking to yourself, oh, can I sow seeds yet? And it's definitely way too early. Well, the good news is you can start sowing seeds in January and February, thanks to the brilliant ancient invention of hotbeds. So last year, or early this year, I did a video about hotbeds, as in this ancient technique of being able to grow food out of the season. And in this video, I wanted to build upon it because this year we created three different hotbeds. We've learned a lot. And when I started this year, I was excited about hotbeds. And now after experiencing them from start to finish, from the creation to the using of the composted material at the end of the season, I am now like, I am absolutely sold on the method. And so this video is my mission to try and get as many people out there making hotbeds as possible. I'm gonna be going through some of the key benefits, um, roughly what they are, and why I think that they're so important for us gardeners, especially if you're pursuing self-sufficiency. And firstly, let's start off by talking about what actually is a hotbed. So a hotbed essentially is a hot compost bin or a hot compost heap that you put some compost on top or some growing medium and then a cold frame on top of that. And what that cold frame does is that it insulates all of the heat that's been generated from the decomposition of organic material and it creates a frost-free growing environment, which is very useful. If you live in a colder climate, like for us, we'll get our last frost around uh, early to mid-May. And so with a hotbed, it means that we can start direct sowing seeds outside you know, you might not have enough space for a polytunnel, but you'll have enough space for a hotbed. You can start direct sowing seeds outside from kind of like late January, early February. If you create the right kind of hotbed, it will, it will maintain temperature for around three months. If it's about a meter of material deep or kind of just over three feet. And from the start of January, daylight hours are starting to increase. And so what you're doing as the daylight hours are starting to increase, you're capturing that light. Usually, for me, if I'm starting to grow food outside, I can only start properly direct sowing from around April onwards. So I've missed out on, you know, three, maybe even four months worth of light levels increasing. So it means you can start early, the growth is absolutely incredible, and I'll come on to that in a little bit. The rough footprint of a hotbed is anywhere between one and a half to 1.8 meters for the length of the four sides. It's like a cube essentially. And the growing frame on top is 1.2 by 1.2 meters or four by four foot. I found out about hotbeds thanks to a great gardener called Jack First. He has something crazy like 30 years worth of uh, experience working with hotbeds. He's written a book and we've also created a course together over on the Abundance Academy. And yeah, I have to give full credit to Jack for getting me absolutely hooked on this, uh, on this fun growing method. Now, the primary benefit of hotbeds from what I found is the ability to produce a lot of food during the hungry gap. So the hungry gap is usually the biggest challenge that most gardeners face. I think in terms of like a UK climate, a hungry gap can be avoided through careful planning and management in terms of succession planting. It's a lot harder if you live in an area that has a huge amount of snowfall, kind of like for us, I can just go out, usually there's no snow and I can just harvest what I want. If things are buried under a lot of snow, it becomes a little bit harder. But with the hotbed, you create this frost-free growing environment and with one of the hotbeds in the secret garden, 40 days after the first direct sowing of seeds, 40 days after that, we'd already harvested two and a half kilos worth of salads. And the hotbed continued to go on to produce more salad than I could have ever possibly have consumed. And it was all during a season when nothing else was growing. And the, the nice thing about gardening is if you start to utilize different elements, for example, you might have a cold frame, a polytunnel, a hotbed, and then your outdoor beds. What you can do is you can kind of strategically plan out when each of those elements are gonna produce salads. So firstly, you'll get your, your early salads from your hotbeds, and then the salads that are sown direct in a polytunnel takeover, and then maybe a cold frame after that. And then once those start kind of going a bit over, 
then finally the salads that you've sown outside or that you've transplanted outside will come into season and so with exception to winter but you can get winter salads you know i've got winter salads in the polytunnel you can fairly easily have unlimited access to salads all 12 months of the growing season one of my favorite things about a hotbed is the sheer variety of different crops that you can start off really really early so for the first hotbed we experimented with ramiel chip wood it was still generating a decent amount of heat in mid-June, uh, four months from when we created it. And one of the first things that I sowed in there was basil, and I, I could enjoy a few basil leaves in March, which was really nice. What I like to say to gardeners is a hotbed allows you to harvest crops in kind of March, April, May, that you usually wouldn't harvest until around June or July. That's really where it helps with the hungry gap. And you're not just limited to salads and herbs. You can do things like uh, spring onions. You can do things like carrots, turnips, beetroot, fennel as well. You can then look at some kind of maybe more tasty salads like pak choy, they did really well. Don't forget about things like pea shoots. So you do have quite a broad range of different crops that you can start off really nice and early and start harvesting kind of April to May time and this is when it's really important to plan for April onwards because March is usually the cutoff when all of the winter vegetables no longer become available like the swede and your pastips and stuff because they start regrowing uh, or like Jerusalem artichokes they'll start re-sprouting there's only very limited things that you can still eat like kale purple sprouting broccoli of course but that's a limited category there's some fantastic leek varieties out there like bandit which you can still harvest up until the first week of may and so this is just a little side tip look for varieties that come into maturity during different stages of the season that's another form of succession growing instead of planting things at different stages so they mature at different stages you can grow different varieties of the same thing that then will naturally mature at different stages throughout the year. Now, the primary benefit is of course a hungry gap. After you've harvested those crops, you can then do succession planting. And so in one of the hotbeds, what we did was we grew over 20 kilos of outdoor cucumbers. Uh, we grew jumbo pink banana squash and around five kilos of cauliflower just in the one hotbed. Um, the other hotbeds, we grew a bunch of pumpkins in as well. And so what it means is that when things are over you can then just plant something else in its place but that's just like a little side effect primary benefit is a hungry gap the secondary benefit of a hotbed is that you're producing a huge volume of compost if you have a small garden sometimes it can be hard to justify having a a compost bin because you know you could be growing in that compost bin there's various different things that you can do to maximize that space like putting a pallet on top and growing on containers on top of the compost bin but with a hotbed you don't have to feel like you're sacrificing any space whatsoever because it turns into this like growing machine i think per square meter a hotbed is perhaps the most productive simple method of growing that i've seen um, I'd, I'd say perhaps even more productive than an entire season of a polytunnel per square meter. We all know as gardeners, you, there's no such thing as too much homemade compost. Probably what I'd say the biggest challenge of creating a hotbed is that you need a lot of material of greens and browns in one go to put together because you, you want to make that hotbed in a day so you can generate that heat. You can't just add bits and bobs over a few months. It's never going to generate that core heat. And so the opportunity now, it isn't even next year yet, the opportunity now is to start collecting separate sources of greens and browns. The traditional hotbeds are made using straw and horse manure. So if you can access a lot of those from like a, a local livery yard or something, then you can, you can build a hotbed all in one go. So what we're doing is collecting autumn leaves, and seaweed and using those as our two primary materials. That's what we did for the two hotbeds in the secret garden and we had a great results. By the way, if you wanna know something crazy about hotbeds, I was not expecting it. it, took me completely by surprise. You let the hotbed settle for two or three days and then you sow directly and less than 48 hours after sowing turnip seeds around two centimeters or an inch deep, they appeared. They were already seedlings in less than two days from direct sowing. 
that was pretty cool. In permaculture gardening, you're always looking at how different elements within the garden can have multiple functions. It's kind of called stacking functions. How can one thing create as many different benefits as possible? And a hotbed is a key example of stacking functions with producing foods and producing compost, but you can continue stacking different functions for that. So one of the ones that I really, really like is at the start of the season, you can use narrow module trays, like my Containerwise HR10 module trays. You can put them between the direct sown rows of seedlings to also benefit from that base heat to germinate a huge amount of seedlings. And with this base heat, they germinate really quickly. You could then move those into a polytunnel or into a mini greenhouse within a polytunnel to keep growing. But you can utilize that heat for uh, an extra purpose. There's so many different ways of approaching how you want to plant up a hotbed. One other example is you might want to grow a load of new potatoes, but after you planted those, you direct sow some rows of radish or some spinach or leafy greens. So you harvest those as the potatoes are starting to come through and start to mature. Another thing that we battle as gardeners are different pests and diseases. But the lovely thing about starting off really, really early with a hotbed is that you're growing during pest-free months because it's usually too cold for them to exist, which means you can grow certain types of leafy greens that very often will get hit badly by flea beetle. They come out as like the most perfect looking vegetables. Um, so that's, that's quite fun and it's a big benefit. In the secret garden, the two hotbeds have finished and now I've started to move material from the hotbed, all of the composted material, to mulch different beds, both the raised beds outside and also the polytunnel beds inside. I only used, used part of the hotbeds to mulch all of the undercover growing space um, and it, the material just looks so nice and I can't wait to plant tomato plants in it next year. One way that hotbeds could be used for new gardens is a kind of a gradual way of increasing fertility within a given area. So if you've got a brand new garden, what you might want to do is place a hotbed in kind of the prime growing position where it gets lots of sun, nice and sheltered. Create a hotbed there this growing season. And then at the end, take apart the sides and kind of surface or, or sheet mulch the ground all around. So what you could do is put down a load of cardboard and then use a rake to spread all of that nice composted material around the vicinity. And then the following growing season, you place a hotbed kind of next to this new patch of, patch of growing space. And so what you're doing is you're bypassing the need to have like separate compost bins and move in loads of compost. Each year, you just find a new location for a hotbed and you open up a nice kind of very rich, very fertile growing area for crops. One concept that I'm also going to try out is kind of a, a hotbed hybrid where I'm going to generate the heat, but I'm going to grow things in 30 litre tubs or buckets that I can partly bury in this material and maybe create a, a makeshift cloche over the top to see if I can start off things without having to need as much material um, or start things off a month earlier. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. And that's part of the joy of gardening is just experimenting. It's taking this, this one technique that kind of originated from, from the Roman times and then trying to just throw as many different kind of ideas and concepts at it to see what sticks in your situation. So that's that's what I'm doing with, uh, with hotbeds at the moment. One of the things that gets me so fired up about gardening is that uh, each method can, can be applied in many different ways. And so take hotbeds, for example. They started off as this kind of ancient growing technique, and now I'm trying to draw as many different ideas, concepts, spin-offs, and learning points from this very simple traditional way of growing food to see how else it can benefit the garden. You know that like really weird week between Christmas and New Year and you're not really sure what to do? Or well, you could start making a hotbed. You could start thinking about where the materials could come from. Um, you could actually maybe get the wood to start building it or find some pallets. Just start getting the process of uh, creating your first ever hotbed. 
There's a lot of information about hotbed grain in my upcoming book, The Self-Sufficiency Garden. I've also mentioned the course and also the video that I did earlier this year. So I've linked to all of those down below. Have a fantastic Christmas and I will see you again soon. Maybe in that strange week or maybe in the new year.